spend money to do things that you do, and you don't have the money and go into debt. So I'm not a big fan of that option. You can, and the two options most people think is I either spend all the money to do all the things I want and I go into debt and it's a problem, or I sacrifice and I don't spend any of the money and I don't do any of the things I want and I, you know, don't go into debt, but like I don't get to do all the things I want. I think my entire life premise is based on the fact that you can find something in the middle and that if you really like dissect and optimize some area and you can do this with almost any area of your life, you find a way to have the experience that's much closer to the experience that you wish you could have at a cost that's much closer to not doing it. When we've chatted in the past, we mostly talk about podcasting stuff and how to grow our shows and some of the just other creator type businesses that we have going on. And we haven't really talked too much about what you've done in the startup world, specifically your two companies, Grove and Milk. So I want to talk about those real quick. Tell us about Grove, what the company did, how it all played out and how you ultimately sold to Wealthfront. Yeah, so I had, you know, I think anyone listening, I'm on the older age of millennial, but like every time I had a conversation with someone in this cohort, this demographic, it was like, hey, how are you feeling? Everyone felt stressed out about money. And it was crazy that no matter how much money you had or how little money you had, everyone was stressed out about money. So I was like, how do you solve this problem? It's not like nobody's tried, right? Like there's lots of startups and you know companies and content to try to help people feel less stressed out about money. And so I was looking for, is there anything that people that felt good about their money had done or did differently than the people who didn't? And it felt like almost everyone I met, the, the closest thing I could track those two groups, people that felt good and people that didn't, were that they'd gone through some type of financial planning process, which was basically looking at the life they wanted to live, how much it cost, how much they had, and like charting a path to get there. And when they've gone through that process, they felt tremendously better about their finances. However, that process is a pain and it is unclear what the best path is. And so I was trying to think, okay, how do you do this? It turns out that there's a whole designation that you can go through a curriculum to become a certified financial planner. And there's actually like very concrete steps you can go through that are well thought out about the financial planning process. But it seemed to be all wrapped up in human financial advisors that cost thousands of dollars to work with to do this financial planning stuff. So we were like, what if we built software to make that process more efficient so that people could do financial planning for less money? And the unfortunate truth and the fortunate truth. So the fortunate thing is it was true. When we put people through that process, they spent less money and they came out the other side feeling much better about finances, whether they had a lot or a little amount of money. However, there is just no easy way to sugarcoat the process of financial planning such that people want to do it now. You know, we met people that were really excited to do it. And then we were like, so we had a wait list early on. And so they would pay $100 to wait in line. They waited in line. We were like, it's your turn. And they're like, I don't want to do it now. We're like, you've been waiting in line. Don't you want to do it? And they're like, not now. And we're like, well, well, we can give you your $100 back. Like, no, no, no. I don't want my $100 back. I want to do this. I just don't want to do it now. And that process would just go on for months and months and months and months. And people just were never ready to get started. And so it made acquiring customers really difficult because people never wanted to get started. We tried millions of things. And then ultimately, we got to this point where we realized the knowledge we had about financial planning and making it better and what we could do would be better served in a company that already had a different way to start building a relationship with customers because financial planning probably wasn't the best front door for personal finance. Similarly, I had gotten introduced to Andy Ratcliffe who started Wealthfront and they'd learned almost an identical lesson with a similar financial planning product that they built, which was it's not the best top of funnel way to get in the door. But they had an amazing investing product and a high, uh, high interest cash account that was doing really well. And so they had a different front door. And so we realized it would be a great combination to kind of work together. We brought over some of the team from Grove and we started working on what are ways that you can kind of build financial planning into a more seamless process uh, that was actually less hands on with humans and more built on technology and automation. So what does that look like today? What is it? What is the end result at Wealthfront, Wealthfront now? So the thing that I worked on first was called autopilot. And we didn't actually so Wealthfront had this vision of self-driving money, but we weren't sure what that looked like. So we spent a lot of time with customers and we realized that kind of one, automation can make everything so much easier. And two, a lot of financial planning was a little bit rules based. So we we're like, okay, what if we just help you automate it all? How much money do you need in your say emergency fund? 
okay, well, you could choose two to or one to six months. You could choose whatever you want. Okay, so now I have my emergency fund goal. What is your kind of stack rank priority of what you want to do with your money? And how much do you need to pay your regular bills? So we built this product called Autopilot that would just monitor your external kind of checking account or your Wealthfront cash account. And anytime you had more money than the amount you wanted to keep, like let's keep $8,000 in my account at all times, we'd sweep the rest over and we would follow a series of rules of let's make sure first we always have three months of savings in your emergency fund. And then next, let's make sure we always max out your IRA. And then next, let's make sure we max out the 529 that you're saving for your kids. And then next, let's save in a taxable brokerage account. And so we just automated it all in the background. There was no, let's meet regularly, let's talk about what to do. It was, let's come up with a series of best practices, have it work in the background, and you can focus on other stuff. And for people who were Wealthfront customers, it was awesome. For people who weren't Wealthfront customers, just like we'd always learned, it wasn't the thing that was gonna get you in the door and get you to sign up for a new product. It's the thing that once you're comfortable with a financial institution, it's gonna make your experience with it so much better. So after Grove, you did Milk? Uh, another company? So it before. Reverse. It before. So, okay. so I, my, my trajectory was worked at a startup, ended up joining this small company called Milk. And the idea was we had a bunch of ideas and we were just going to like try them out and see if any of them stuck and turn that into the company. So it was a small team. There were seven of us. It was like three engineers, two designers, you know, and two kind of product business, et cetera. And so we were all, we played around with a bunch of ideas and none of them really stuck. But we liked working on kind of things related to social. And so about a year into that company, we were like, none of the ideas we're working on seem to be working. And we had a great conversation with Google where they were like, we're launching Google Plus. Do you want to just come work on this? And we were like, that seems like a pretty good idea. And we sold the company to Google about a year in. So on one hand, success. On the other hand, failure. Like we didn't build the thing we set out to build, but we had a good outcome. And I ended up spending the next four years at Google Unfortunately, you know, it didn't work out at Google Plus. I think the the stars weren't aligning on our vision and and the team's vision and it was a very big team and you know, ultimately that the vision they had not not saying my vision would have would have particularly done well, but nobody's vision seemed to work out cuz I don't think Google Plus if it even does exist is something anyone's using. But I got this great opportunity to transfer within Google to Google Ventures and I spent about three and a half years doing early stage investing at Google Ventures. And I probably learned more in those three years about everything from investing to building to, you know, teams, like just a, so much getting like a full crash course in early stage investing. And it was such an awesome opportunity. I absolutely want to dive into Google Ventures a bit. But before we do, what is with the name Milk? And the reason I ask that is because you guys were called Milk. And then I'm pretty sure you know who Sean Purry is from My First Million. He had his company, The Milk Road. And I'm like, what is going on with this? What is, what's going on with milk? And why are people naming their companies after the drink? I'm honestly, if we, we were just, we were talking about like, what's just a clean, simple, easy name for a studio? I don't know where, I honestly don't know where the idea came out of. It was just like a simple, easy, clean word. We ended up getting the domain mi.lk, um, which was like an awesome domain, right? Like, you know, it doesn't get much shorter than that. Uh, we saw the guy that had milk.com and his, I don't know if his website still says this, but he's like, I'm interested. I would be willing to sell this for a number greater than seven figures. We're like, okay, well, he has like one buyer at that price. And it's like, you know, the, the milk lobbying association that ran all the got milk ads. So basically like he, he wasn't interested. So, um, I don't really know where it came from. We had this beautiful cursive font and it was just like a simple, clean design. But at the end of the day, it was a studio. And so the product we launched, the first product we launched was called Oink. And it was an app that helped you like find the best things in, in any city. And so Milk was really just like, you know, alphabet in terms of like a holding company name that it didn't really matter uh, what it was because none of the products were branded with it. All right. So I feel better knowing that I didn't miss any, uh, some trend there's no secret or something connotations. Yeah. Yeah, yeah. There's no secret. A, an easy, milk. simple word. Yeah. Okay, cool. So tell me about bit more about Google Ventures. You said you learned a lot. Tell me some of the, the biggest things that you learned and, and also maybe tell us some of the successful investments you were part of as, as part of Google Ventures. Yeah, I learned a lot of things. So one was, I mean, where do I even start? So in the, my time there, we probably did about 200 early stage investments. And there were only two or three of us doing those early stage investments. So, and 
for every deal we did, we probably saw a hundred other pitches. So like thousands of pitches over four years. And the, a term that gets thrown around in venture capital a lot is pattern recognition because there's no perfect rubric. You can't like codify the principles of how you pick a deal. And so you almost need to learn, like you learn this pattern recognition of like, oh, these are the things that, you know, founders, you know, exhibit that, you know, create deals that we like as a company. And you kind of figure that out over time. But it's very hard. It's something that you almost have to learn to become an instinct than something you can just write down on paper as, as a set of checklists or rules. And so, and everyone kind of determines their own version of that. So for me, the thing that I was always really interested in at the earliest stage of startups was not, you know, the idea necessarily, because most companies end up changing their ideas significantly. So my wife was fortunate to join uh, Lyft before it was even called Lyft. It was a company called Zimride, and they were doing long distance ride sharing, kind of like the board that if anyone's on the older edge of millennial, like we had in colleges in the basement where it was like, I'm going home to spring break and I'm driving to Tucson. Does anyone want to drive home with me uh, for spring break or Thanksgiving or Christmas? And they were building that. But the founders were so obsessed with finding ways to make it easier for people to share rides together. It was like they were obsessed with that. And so when you meet people like that, it's not necessarily about the specific idea they have now as much as it is about their passion and excitement for what area or industry they're tackling. And so one of the first deals I did was a company called Clever. And at the time, they were building a product that made it easy for schools to sync their database of students with the database, with, with uh, educational learning apps. And it seems so obvious that something like this would exist. But at the time, the most frequent way that like a piece of software that students had access to would know who the students were was that the teacher for each classroom would email a list of students to the software company and they would load it in. And the reason why is that it was so fragmented how many different student information system databases there were. There was like no clear leader with market share. So nobody did anything. And so when I met these guys, I was like, well, this is kind of boring. Like, I'm not particularly in love with education. I have no idea how big this thing went. But the three founders were so obsessed with making the educational world more efficient that they were going to give up at nothing to try and solve this problem. And so I didn't invest because I was like, ooh, this idea could be this big and it's going to generate this much revenue. It was purely that, and, and this is true of their first stage, right? When they raised future rounds, it was very much about revenue projections and how the company is doing. But at the earliest stage, it was all about, are these founders massively obsessed with this thing? And how excited or, or how much opportunity could the space have? Like, is it a big market? Yes, educational software is a big market. But I don't, like what they were doing, I didn't really try to correlate what they were doing to a market size at that stage. And then the third thing, so I was cared about, like, is there a big market? Like, is there something they could do? How passionate are they about the thing? Can they do the thing? So, like, did they have a team of people that could build the software? Like, was there an engineer on the team that could do the thing? Like, that was really important to me. And then maybe did they have some traction? And if they had, like, all four, the deal probably would have already been done. And if they had none, nobody would have done the deal, or at least no one on our team would. And the more of those things they had, the faster I wanted to move. And ultimately, they sold the company for about $500 million, which was an incredible outcome that no one would have expected. And, you know, when we wrote a check, it was, you know, a couple million dollar company. Uh, but so that was a good outcome. And something that because of I ended up like building a vertical of education tech in as an investor, which was not something I was particularly knowledgeable about, but I had to get knowledgeable. And so then I ended up doing a lot of those deals. Uh, so that was one example of both what I looked for in a company that did well. And then over time, we we just did so many deals because we were just try, trying to find exciting founders doing interesting stuff. And it, it kind of, it's funny because I was able to be both very risk tolerant in my career. But when I look at my own particular investing portfolio, especially now that I'm not a venture capitalist at all, like I was able to separate that risk tolerance from a personal and professional level. So I think a lot of people you know, look out at Silicon Valley and all these startups and they think, oh man, if I, if I could have access, I would just, that's how I, why would I invest in index funds? And I'm like, I don't know. I have, I have the access, I have the experience. And like my portfolio is 90, 90 some plus percent index funds. So 
Um, I think just because I like it, it might seem like a sexy market, but I'm not convinced personally, having been deep in it, that it's how almost anyone should be investing, you know, any meaningful amount of their money. How does someone even get in the room to pitch Google Ventures? Like, how does that work? So I would say we got a lot of cold emails, just like, you know, hey, I want to talk to someone. It's not hard to find someone's email address. Like one of my favorite hacks in general is if you're looking for a job, don't just go apply on the website. Like find some way to get connected with the company. Like in many companies, there is a way to do this. And it might not be the most obvious way. You might have to guess email addresses, but between some browser extensions, there's a browser extension called Lucia that I really like that when you're on LinkedIn, it just tells you people's email addresses. Um, you can just guess and search people's email addresses with quotes. And there are, I would say like 50% of the people I've ever wanted to email have done something on the internet where they've had their email address published, whether they've posted it on Twitter, or whether it's in some PDF, like something. So find someone's email address and send them a note that shows how, how interested you are in that particular person. So when I would get an email address, email that's like, dear future investor, we would like to work with you. It's like, eh. But when someone's like, hey, I saw you got you led the round at this company and I love what they're doing. And I feel like for you to have spotted that means you probably have a lot of experience in industry X and we're building in this industry. And here's what we think we're excited about. Could we share a little bit more about what we're doing? Now I'm interested, but the more generic it was, the more I just think you're kind of blasting everyone. But the reality is the deals that every VC wants to get in are like the hottest deals. And so the more desperate the founders are for money, it's almost like inversely correlated. So I would say the best way to get an introduction is to get someone, another founder who that company's invested in to introduce you. So if you, if you have a startup and you want to raise money, find some founder that's raised money from an investor and get them to be like, this company's awesome. You should talk to them. And I think any investor will take that meeting every time. It's like a bank. They'll give you a loan when you don't need it, but not when you, when you actually need it. It's just exactly. the way it always, always works. So we talked, we spent the first quarter or so of this episode talking about what you've done in the past. I want to spend the rest of the episode talking about what you're doing now and, and really all about the hacks and the optimization that you you do. So first, before we get into that, what what led you to even wanting to optimize your life and specifically all the different types of points that you do? And what does it mean to be a quote unquote life hacker? Ooh, lots of good questions. I think my general premise is there's kind of three ways to operate. And I'm making these three ways up, but I think, I think I've think i thought about it enough that I can make up a framework on the fly. You can either spend money to do things that you do, and you don't have the money and go into debt. So I'm not a big fan of that option. You can, and the two options most people think is I either spend all the money to do all the things I want and I go into debt and it's a problem, or I sacrifice and I don't spend any of the money and I don't do any of the things I want. And I, you know, don't go into debt, but like, I don't get to do all the things I want. I think my entire life premise is based on the fact that you can find something in the middle and that if you really like dissect and optimize some area and you can do this with almost any area of your life, you find a way to have the experience that's much closer to the experience that you wish you could have at a cost that's much closer to not doing it. And so, you know, for example, if you find the right resources and the right you know, podcasts or blogs or whatever, you can get a lot of the information that you would otherwise need to hire, you know, an expensive concierge doctor to get. And there are also products and services out there that kind of make that easier. So, you know, when I met a couple of friends of mine that had a lot more money than me, they're like, oh, I've got this awesome doctor and I pay tens of thousands of dollars a year and they do all these diagnostics. And like, I feel like I know so much more about my health. And I was like, I want that. I was like, how much is that? And so I was like, well, the one I use is like $50,000 a year. I'm like, okay, well, I'm not, there's no chance on earth I'm paying $50,000 a year to have a doctor. Like I have insurance. So like my doctor should be like a $20 copay. So like we're off by like multiple orders of magnitude. But I was like, okay, what are they doing? And they're like, oh, here's a list of stuff. And if you start Googling around, you're like, oh, these are the kinds of health diagnostics that people do who have these doctors do. Well, some of them are even covered by insurance. So like you can take that into your own hands. And you can go pick up the right book or listen to the right podcast to understand a little bit more about those things and use services online uh, that you know do biomarker analysis and all that kind of stuff. And now all of a sudden you're getting that experience for a fraction of the cost. So that's an example in health. 
I feel like I'm probably more well known for in the travel world. It's like, do I want to fly on like a nice bed when I'm crossing the ocean on a 10 hour flight? Absolutely. Like, do I want someone bringing me like a nice meal and like, you know, whatever? Of course, who doesn't want to fly business class and first class around the world? Am I ever going to spend five to $10,000 for a 10 hour flight? No, that's to me, to me and my personal financial situation. That's crazy. Like if it were up to me, I would never spend that amount of money. And it is up to me. So I don't think I've ever spent, you know, a thousand dollars or more on a flight. But if you play the points game and you optimize it in the right way, you can get that business class flight for a fraction of what it normally would have costed. And in some cases, less than you would have paid if you paid out of pocket for the coach flight. And so I think I've dedicated a lot of time because I really enjoy traveling to finding a way to have the five-star luxury travel experience at the kind of, I don't know, maybe two or three-star backpackery price. And maybe it's a little bit more than, you know, a hostel, but like you're able to find ways to get that experience for much less. And that's what I've kind of focused on is how do I do the research and dig in to find all the tools, the tips, the strategies, the tactics to have those experiences for less? Because I want to live like that amazing life. I just don't want to pay the money to do it. People like Dave Ramsey, as an example, say that credit cards shouldn't be used at all, regardless of the points. And then other people say that credit card users spend more because they're using credit cards than they would if they had paid in cash, which basically negates or wipes away any benefit that you're receiving from those credit card points. I personally use credit cards for everything. Every single purchase, I use a credit card. I don't think I've ever even used the debit card I have. I very rarely ever use cash. And I've never spent a penny on interest. So I never carry a balance. So I feel like I keep it in control. But I could see it being true that I maybe spend more money because I'm using a credit card, not cash. Because the few times, it's rare, but the few times that I do have to use cash, it kind of hurts. Like it doesn't really hurt. It's just like, oh man, like, I don't know. It just feels different than when I'm using my card, either entering it online or even just entering the chip at a store. So I think I could be potentially spending more money just because I'm using a credit card. And, and maybe that's even offsetting the amount of, of points I get, even though I probably get thousands and thousands of dollars a year in points. So yeah, I'm curious how you kind of balance these, these ideas. And, and I know you obviously think it's, it's worthwhile, but why do you think it's worthwhile? Well, first off, if anyone has any high interest debt, and I'll, I'll, I don't know what the right threshold is now in this high, high interest rate environment, but I'd, let's say like over 8%. Normally, I'd say like over 5%, but now that mortgages are kind of tipping over 7%, say more than 8%. So if you're carrying a credit card balance, if you have a really high interest car loan or a title loan or anything like that, this is not for you. Like the, You are never going to earn credit card rewards that make it worth that debt. So step one, I'm sure there is another episode of this podcast that would be an incredible listen. And you can put a link in the show notes about how to think about debt, how to get on a payoff strategy and build your credit and all that. That's more important. Now, let's say you're past that. And so for Dave Ramsey, maybe his audience is entirely filled with people that given access to unlimited amounts of spending beyond their means, they will just do it. And if you're the kind of person that would spend more money with a credit card, yeah, it's not a good fit for you. Like That's just clear. But if you're the kind of person who isn't going to spend a lot more money. Like if you're going out to dinner, whether you pay with cash or your credit card, if the fact that you have the credit card in your wallet means you're going to order three times as much or a nice bottle of wine, you should pay with cash because the points aren't going to make up for that. Like the, the point value is like at max, maybe a 10% return. So, uh, and if you're not that optimized, maybe it's a 2% return. So like the window is two to 10% back. So if you're going to spend 20% more, bad deal. If you're going to spend 1% more, probably a good deal. Uh, and, and you could probably A-B a test this. Like, why don't you take a month and just spend cash? You might find that there are a lot of things that are very hard to pay with cash. Like, maybe use your debit card. I don't know if that'll burn as much, but like, you could try to test this and be like, am I actually spending more when I have a credit card? For me, I don't think I am because I'm just making this decision of do I want the thing or not, or do I need the thing or not, and then paying for it. And like, it, for me, I've never felt the burn of using cash. Uh, if anything, I feel the burn of using cash is actually that I like tracking my spending. So I do it all in Copilot. And with cash, it's just so hard. With a credit card, I can actually see where I'm spending money. So I could actually make a case that because it's so easy for me to track my spending using a lot of different apps, I personally use Copilot. Like by using a credit card, I'm able to track my spending and see where the money's going. 
And I can't remember the stat. So I just started I have, working with Copilot because I reached out to them. I was like, I love your product. Can we work together? Can we come up with a deal for my audience? So if you go to allthehacks.com slash deals, by the time you hear that, hopefully we'll have a good deal for Copilot. Uh, and I love it. But I think they found that people save some meaningful amount, like more than 10% of their spending. Get, their re spending gets reduced by more than 10% just by tracking it. And I could tell you that tracking your spending, if you're still using cash, is so much harder that I imagine most people listening won't do it. So for however much more you might spend by using a credit card, I wonder if that's negated by, by the fact that if you track your spending, it's so much easier to do with a credit card because your transactions could get imported automatically versus you manually needing to type in how much money did I spend with cash? How much money did I spend here? I guess you could still do that with a debit card, but I don't know. Like I, Most of the studies I've seen comparing credit card to cash is actually like, physical green dollar um, cash. So for me, I don't think that I'm spending more by using a credit card, but I am getting two to 10% back when I use that credit card. So it's a no brainer. Like, and, and the difference between two and 10% isn't just picking a card that aligns with your spending, which is part of it, right? If you spend all your money on dining and groceries, well, there's cards that earn four points per dollar on dining and groceries. So like that is probably the card you should use. Um, if you spend all of your money on travel, there are cards that earn three points per dollar on travel, or if it's all on flights, five points per dollar on flights, like you can pick a card that aligns best with where you spend your money and that'll maximize your return. And then the second piece is using those points in a way that gets the most value. And so if you have a million points on, you know, chase and you decide to get gift cards with those points, you're probably going to get a fraction of the value as if you wanted to use those points for travel. And so you might get two, three times as much using them to get travel by booking in the travel portal on Chase's website. But you might get another two to three times more points if you take those points and transfer them to an airline or a hotel group like Hyatt or United and book directly with those airline and hotels. And then you might be getting, gosh, I've had instances where each point's worth 10 cents. So uh, if you, let's take an example of you have a card that earns three points per dollar on dining and you're able to get 10 cents per point out of the value. That's like 30% cash back every time you go out to eat, which is pretty cool. Now, those 10% examples are few and far between. And I think you could make a case that had I not had those points, I wasn't going to stay at the hotel that would have otherwise cost $1,800 a night. So maybe I would have you know, maybe they're not really worth that much if we're being like totally honest and I'll be totally honest. Like I'm not going to spend $1,800 a night. So are they worth that? No, but they're certainly worth more than I would have gotten buying a gift card with my points uh, by a huge margin. There's a lot there that I want to talk about, but first why Copilot? And I, I think it's funny you mentioned that because I didn't know that you used them. I downloaded their app I don't know, a couple months ago, maybe, maybe even longer, maybe last year. I, it's been a while. I didn't love it. Uh, ah. it, was, it was hard for me to get into it. Uh, so I'm curious, what am I, what am I missing? I, I use Mint right now. I really like Mint a lot. It's free, super easy to use, and I can do a lot of things that I need to do with it. So I'm curious. I'm always looking for something better, though. So why Copilot? So there's a lot of options. And when I wanted to decide what to use, I used Rocket Money, Monarch Money, Mint, Tiller HQ. I was going to ask you about that. And Tiller. Copilot. So I tried all of those. Are there other ones I should have tried? I'm sure someone listening has another. Oh, and YNAB. I tried YNAB, the, like, the tried and true thing. I couldn't get I, that one to work for me either. So for me, there's kind of two styles of budgeting, if you will. And I hate the word budgeting because I'm not budgeting as much as I am spending tracking. One is budgeting, right? I want to say this is how much I'm going to spend in a category. And I want to really hold myself to it. My style is more I want to understand where I'm spending money. And I'm pretty good if I feel like I'm spending too much at course correcting next month. So I don't really need to set a budget per se to say, I only want to spend $300 this month on going out to eat. I want to say, how much am I spending going out to eat? Do I need to ratchet it back? So YNAB is really good if you're the kind of person that wants to set budgets and try to stick within them. That was not me. YNAB wasn't the right product. Amongst all the other ones, I put a high value in my world at products that just like look beautiful. Like I like des well-designed products. I have an iPhone. Uh, like I enjoy Apple's design. And I think that Mint for as much as it has many features is filled with like, go get this ad, go, go get this thing ad. Like get, there's just lots of ads 
all the monetization of the product is ad supported and it just it's like so overwhelming and this the ease at which you can customize things was not as simplistic so like hey every time there's another transaction with this name do this thing and it just kind of happens automatically uh, so mint was just like a little bit frustrating and like the ui of like looking at how your spending was happening wasn't great for me um monarch rocket money were similar in that i just felt like they were slightly less easy to use and i'm a crazy person when it comes to this so i actually went back and imported 18 months of transaction history to mint like to all six of these apps and went through and like ca recategorized every transaction in every single app and so if you listen to my show on all the hacks like that's the kind of thing that i do i'm like i'm going to spend 40 hours testing out eight budgeting apps to try to figure out which one I think makes the most sense for me. And if you're like me, you might like a certain one. And I'll tell you what I, I thought that rocket money was the best option. If you don't want to pay a subscription, um, when it comes to something that's a combo of like easy and has enough automation to kind of do things quickly for you, but also had enough flexibility that you could create your own categories and, you know, kind of design it in a little, a little different way. So that was my favorite free one. And then, but Copilot was was a better budgeting, spending tracking app for me. And I love that I could just pull it up and look at categories, look at them over time, uh, see all the recurring transactions I have going on, see where I'm spending the most, see where I'm on track, you know, on a month by month basis. Looks like this month I'm way over. I I'm trending to have July be a huge month because my wife and I just took a really big expensive vacation. Um, and so the biggest challenge to taking control of your personal finances, improving your investment returns and building a better future is just getting started. This means getting organized, having a plan and being disciplined. As Mark Twain once said, the secret to getting ahead is getting started to break out of the treadmill of slaving away each week only to have nothing left over watching the savings you have get eroded away by inflation's vicious bite or freeing yourself from the corporate grind. It all requires you to master the conversion of time into value. To help you do this, we created a list of four simple steps to taking control of your personal finances and life. And you can download it for free by clicking the link in today's description. I don't know. I've never been as excited to track my spending as I have the last like six, seven months using Copilot. Like I'm opening up every day and it's really easy to categorize a transaction. Uh, yeah, I felt like Mint to, to pull out your phone and see if I had any transactions in the last couple of days and like categorize them in two seconds just felt like a lot of work. And the Copilot is just like, it's just so easy. And they have a couple of cool things like they'll sync with Amazon and pull in your purchases so that when you're looking at your transaction on Amazon and you're like, God, what was this? How do I categorize this? Was this home? Was this kids? They'll just show you the purchases you made. Um, and same thing with Venmo. They'll like, there's a way to integrate Venmo such that you actually see what it was. It's not just a Venmo charge. So it's a little easier to categorize stuff. I don't know. That's a few of the reasons I, I like it. Um, and, yes. and everyone should know, like, like I said, full disclosure, I am now working with them. Like they're a partner of the podcast. But it all started the way almost every one of my sponsors in the podcast has, which is, I love this product. And like right now, unintentionally, I'm wearing two articles of like my, my pants and my shirt are both Viore. So it's like, I love Viore. I already own them all. I wear them all the time. Can I partner with this brand? And so I'm regularly doing that for my partners. It's just like partnering with brands that I already use. So maybe I'll have to give Copilot. Yeah. Maybe I'll have to give Copilot another try. I uh, literally just this morning was working on my mint. Uh, but not really budgeting. I'm kind of in the same spot as you. I don't really do the budgeting, but just kind of tracking my spending, seeing where it's going. And I had a couple of Amazon charges and I didn't know what they were. I didn't remember. So I had to open Amazon and my other bra, my, not my other browser, my other screen and just had to enter it in because I didn't remember what it was. So that might be a, a cool feature of, of Pilot for me to try out. But getting back for, to credit card Quick thing points, though, for you yeah. and anyone that, that does any type of budgeting and, and expense tracking on Amazon, if you go to Amazon, and you hover over the accounts thing and you click your account and you click account and you scroll down on the left, there's a, a link to something called your transactions. And instead of ordering everything by orders, it orders it by every charge that's hit your credit card. That's so, super annoying too, how they split it up. Yeah, so sometimes it's hard because you're like, ah, oh, Amazon hit my card for $23. 
and you go in and you're like, I haven't ordered anything that's $23. It's like, oh, well, I ordered this thing where half of it shipped, so they charged my card differently. When you go to the Your Transactions page, it just shows you like, charge for $5, charge for $34.72, charge for $31.93, and then you can link out to the order and find it. So I will say, whether you're using YNAB or just a spreadsheet or anything, if you are trying to figure out and categorize what you spent money on on Amazon, find the transactions page. It's so much easier than the orders page. Yeah, that's a good that's a good hack. I'm going to have to do that because that, that is always a problem for me. I'll buy like four or five things and then two will be in, in one order and three will be in the other and one will be in, like it never, never adds up. So I definitely have to do that. I didn't know that that was there. Getting so, back to the credit card points. For someone who uses credit cards, they're interested in it. They've kind of, maybe always wanted to do more with their credit card points, but they've just never spent any time on it. Where do they get started? Give us the 101 version of getting started with optimizing credit card rewards. Yeah, so I think I'll give the two part, the, op, the 101 for earning and the 101 for redeeming. So 101 for earning is look at where you spend money. And, and it doesn't, I, I feel like some people think this has to be a science. You don't have to go use Mint or Copilot. And be like, Did I spend $3,008 on dining over the last three months or was it 3,010? No, like roughly, and most credit cards will give you an annual spending report where you can just like download the spending report from Amex or Chase at the end of the year and be like, where did I spend money? Look at where you spend money. You probably already know this answer and, and think, okay, let's try to get a card that aligns with where I spend money. And, and that's my, my primary card. I will say I did an incredible amount of, I don't know, analysis is the right word. So I built this spreadsheet that had the top, I don't know, 20, 30 cards in it. And if you want it, you can go to allthehacks.com slash card value and you can get it for as little as a dollar. Uh, and I, you basically check a number of cards and put in how much money you spend in different categories. And it'll tell you how many on average points you're earning. Um, so if you spend all your money on dining and you, you get a 1% cash back card, you're going to get 1% back. But if you get a card that has points on dining, you're going to get more. What I found, which kind of is counter to what I do personally, is that you get a ton of value with your first and second card. And once you get a third credit card, you're, going, you're, you're not really adding that much extra value in terms of like optimization and more earning. So getting the right two card combo is really valuable. Three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. 10. You're really diminishing returns. So it's finding the one or two cards that are gonna most align with your spending. And the only exception I'll give there is like, if you, if you have rent, the built card is just like, um, I would, I would almost go as far as to say must have, because it's the only card out there that lets you earn points on rent and you don't have to pay a fee to do that. So up to a hundred thousand dollars of rent a year, you can earn a hundred thousand points. So highly, I, they're not a partner of mine. They don't pay me any money, but if you go to all the hacks.com slash built, it's my referral link. Uh, and I would love you to do that. But, um, I think that's the one exception is like it, there's a two card combo. And then if you have rent and you want to add a built card or make it your primary card, highly recommend. So that's the earning side. Um, then on the redeeming side, I think you have two options. You say, I don't really want to go deep down this rabbit hole. And you redeem your points in the portal, like go to the chase travel portal, redeem points. And you're going to get somewhere between one and one and a half cents per point. And is it the best possible use of your points? No. Is it really easy to do? Yes. If you want to go a little bit further, you get a tremendous amount of value by having what I'll call flexible points, which is Chase points, Amex points, Capital One points, City points, or Built points. And they're flexible in that they're able to be used lots of places. You could transfer them to different airlines all over the world. So I've gotten uh, tremendous value transferring points to Air France. And not because I'm necessarily going to France, but Air France is a partner with KLM. They're part of the same mileage program. So if you're going to Amsterdam, um, but you can also book flights using Air France points on any of the Sky Team airlines. So Delta and other things. Um, British Airways, I've gotten some great deals booking flights within the US on American Airlines using British Airways points. And so I get a ton of value transferring points to other airlines. Uh, a really concrete example was I was trying to go down to San Diego, which is like, it's normally a cheap flight from San Francisco, but for whatever reason, it was like $250 and it was pretty last minute. But I transferred some points to Avianca, which is a you know Latin American airline. I think they're based in Colombia. And I got the flight for 6,000 points. 
Like if I were to book a flight in the portal, 6,000 points is going to get me like 60 to $90, but the flight was to almost $300. So finding the right way to do this point transferring stuff takes a little bit of effort and results in a tremendous amount of benefit. And so there are a lot of tools that help make it easier. There's a tool called point.me that makes it easy to search for award flights. Um, and there's a tool called seats.arrow. Uh, I'm, I'm going to do an episode soon about like all the tools and how they all work and what the pros and cons of each of them. But there are a bunch of these different tools. If you search award search tools is kind of the industry term, you'll find them. Seat Spy is another one that focuses on one route at a time but gives you a year of availability. Uh, but if you play around with these tools, you can find really, really great deals. And so I'd say that's the answer. And if you really want to, you know, if you're on the higher end of the points earning spectrum, there are services where you could just pay someone. It usually costs about $150 per person to maybe $200 and they'll just do it all for you. And so I think at sometimes you're like, why would I pay someone? That sounds crazy. And you're like, okay, well, how much is like six hours of my time worth? And if I'm not going to, if I'm otherwise not going to get this much value, is it worth it? And usually you only have to pay like $25 and then the rest only if they find something. So if you're really excited to take your honeymoon and you want to fly in business class to Europe and those tickets are 10 grand for two people and someone can get them for you for the points equivalent of a thousand dollars and you got to pay them, you know, $300 to find those flights for you for two people. Well, yeah, it's actually like a, a lot better deal. So I think sometimes we get caught up in like paying other people for time, but at some point, I think we all cross this threshold where we're like, oh, my time is valuable. And if this person can save me a lot of it or do it better than me and save me money in the process, it's worth it. So I think you have a lot of options, but I think learning how to get value out of transferring points to airlines and hotel groups is where you go from unlocking some value to unlocking a lot of value. But just using the right card is going to unlock a ton of value for people. Yeah, I think that's where I need the most work is learning how to transfer between things. And and we're going to talk about a couple more situations. But also for anybody listening, I know Chris is mentioning a lot of like really great resources from personal finance tools and resources, his own resources to a bunch you just mentioned in that response. So I'll, I'll make sure I put all those in the show notes for everybody listening. And also just to clarify, the seats.arrow is, is dot A-E-R-O, not A-R-R-O. W, which I spelled it wrong the first time. So again, I'll put all this in the show notes for everybody, but just wanted to clarify that. Now, is there anything better than Southwest Companion Pass? Like, is there any way, are there any, any, yeah, is there anything better than that? And, and what we can dive into more specifics of my situation uh, to, if we need to, but I, I'm just curious, generally speaking, is there anything better than the Southwest Companion Pass? And for people who don't know what that is, maybe explain quickly what, what that is. Yeah, so Southwest, almost every airline has some type of, you know, kind of like elite status program. You fly enough on the airline and you get different tiers. And they're often like silver and gold and diamond and platinum. And um, Southwest is a little different in every possible way. Um, the primary way that they're the most different is if you go to any search other than Southwest.com, you can't find Southwest prices. So if you're new to the travel hacking game, I would, or even just saving money on travel game, one, I think Google Flights is the best place to search for flight prices. But two, Southwest never shows up on Google Flights. The, the flights do, but the prices don't. And so I think, I unfortunately, you probably always need to do two searches. It's like Google Flights and then Southwest. Um, but Southwest has A-list, A-list preferred, which are their kind of tiers of status. And then the third one, and I think now it's 135,000 points a year, you get what's called Companion Pass. And with Companion Pass, you can nominate one person and you can actually change it three times a year. And that person flies for free anytime you buy a ticket. And you don't even have to buy the ticket. If you use your points to buy a ticket, they can still fly free. You just pay taxes and fees, which on most domestic flights is like $5.60. So if you have a partner and you guys want to travel a ton, domestically, Mexico, Caribbean, Hawaii, uh, Southwest Network isn't, isn't too international outside of kind of North America, Caribbean, but every single flight you take, someone gets to come for free. It's incredible. And like, if you want to do that and then on the summer, you know, your spouse is, you know, tied up with work, you want to travel with a friend, you can nominate, switch it to the friend, travel with them for a few months and switch it back to your spouse. Like it, it's an incredible thing. But the extra incredible thing is that almost every single elite program makes it very difficult to earn their status without flying. Southwest is a rare exception 
where you can earn companion pass just from the points you get from a credit card, including the points you get from a sign-up bonus on a credit card. So if you need 135,000, you, know, you might have to spend $135,000 on a credit card. But if you open up a credit card at a time where Southwest has a 60,000 point sign-up bonus, and by the way, if you open up two Southwest credit cards at that time, you're already off to the races. If you hit those two welcome bonuses, you're at 120,000 points. Chances are those credit cards had a, a thing that was like, you know, spend $5,000 in the first 90 days and get this bonus. Between the points you're going to get from that spending and the welcome bonus, you might already be there. And so I think within the industry, the way to hack companion pass, and by the way, whatever, whenever you earn it, you get it for the rest of that year and the next year. So the real hack is get the card in like December, spend some money on it, but make sure you don't spend enough to hit that welcome bonus until January. January statement closes, you get those welcome bonuses posted. Now you've got it for the rest of that year and the next year. So if you're thinking about this coming into 2024, make sure you, know, you could open a personal card and a business card and all of a sudden, by January 2024, you spend the welcome bonuses, you get there, you've got two years of nominating someone to fly anywhere you fly for free. It's absolutely amazing. And so a lot of people will do that for two years, and then if they have a partner, they'll switch. That partner will open up one or two Southwest cards, get that welcome bonus, then they'll do it for two years. Now, four years later, maybe the first partners now you know, downgraded or closed their Southwest card, they do it again. And I know people that for, you know, the better part of eight years have been cycling between their partner to have companion pass for eight years. So the short answer is, if you're in a relationship, you don't have kids where, you know, if you want to do kids, you and your partner could do it at the same time, nominate your kids. Like, but no, there's not much better than companion pass. I think I've done it twice. And so we've had it for probably four years and it's great. I think that is an ultimate hack if you want to travel in North America. But if your goal is, I want to go to Europe or Asia, it's not, you know, not going to help you much there. So this is my second time with the Companion Pass. The first time I earned it, it was totally by mistake. I didn't know anything about really credit card performance. I knew I was like earning some cash back, but I didn't really know. I wasn't optimizing like you, you're talking about here. I opened a, a credit card with the rewards bonus. So I got like 80,000, I think, points, like maybe in may-ish and then so i earned it like later that year and so i think i earned it in september or something so i got it for that year and then the following year and i realized okay well now that i get it for a year and a half i next time i do this i can do it well uh, or properly and so now i earned it in january or february of this year and i have so i have it until december of next year and i fly about 50 times a year with my girlfriend and we fly only in the u.s so we fly companion pass and so we fly almost 50 52 weeks a year and we do that buy one get one free and so i didn't think there was going to be anything better than that but i had to ask because like i said i fly a lot but i've never flown first class until like two weeks ago i flew first class for the first time ever uh, the only reason i did it was because i had bought like a normal general admission ticket or coach or whatever you want to call it and they upgraded when i was doing checkout they're like okay upgrade to first class for 47 dollars, and i was like yep done i will absolutely do that so I did it. And the downside there, though, is now I feel spoiled. And I'm like, oh, my God, first class, even though it was a pretty short flight, I was like, oh, my God, first class is awesome. So much better than any seat on Southwest. And so I'm like, I was like kind of hoping that there was a way that I could still use a non Southwest rewards system to get something equivalent to the Southwest companion pass. But given that I get 50 ish flights a year, buy one, get one free. I figured there's probably nothing, nothing better than that. No, I think the best option is, for you is just make sure you're diversifying your points so you have some points in a program like Chase or Amex or City or Capital One or Built, and then save that business class for when it really matters. So if you're going out, we, we took a trip uh, last December and we went to London and Paris and it was me, my wife, two kids, and we have an au pair from Spain and the five of us are going to Europe. And it was like, let's drop all of our points, not all, but we dropped about 420,000 points and we all did business. And it was like, you know, everyone got to sleep a little bit on the plane. And I mean, one of the babies, one of the kids was only like six months. So we only needed four tickets, but it was amazing. And it was just like made the whole travel experience so much better versus if I'm flying 
business class to LA. It's like, yeah, it's like, it feels nice. And, but, but it's like, save it for when it really matters. Um, and by the way, I was looking right now on Southwest, the personal cards right now are at about 50,000 point welcome bonus, but the business cards are at 80. And then the, it, it's not a cheap card. The, the rapid rewards premier business card right now is at 120,000 points. Now, granted, you've got to spend $15,000 in nine months. But, you know, if you started using that this year and just hit that nine month mark in January, hit that 15,000 mark in January, you'd get 120,000 points. Now, caveat, I, I stand corrected reading this. After you spend 3,000, you get the first 60. And then after you spend the, uh, t you spend the next 12,000, you get another 60. So you want to make sure you don't get that first 60 in one year. Um, so maybe, ho maybe hold off or, or, or wait until you, you can hit it, but that's a huge, huge way to get there quickly, right? 120,000 points from the card. You got to spend 15,000 to get it. You're already going to be at 135 by the time you're done. Um, and, and a couple hacks here. So if you're trying to earn a welcome bonus, whether it's Southwest or Chase or anything, God, I have too many hacks right here. I want to remind me to come back to business cards, but I'm not an advocate of, Ooh, I need to hit this bonus. Let's go spend money. I don't need to spend. So that is not what you want to do in this circumstance. But some things that you can do if you're trying to hit uh, the minimum spend to get a welcome bonus without spending more money, a, a favorite of mine is just buying gift cards for things you know you need, assuming you can support it with your cash flow. So if you shop a lot at Whole Foods, you can go to Whole Foods and you could buy Whole Foods gift cards. So if you know you spend $500 a month on groceries, you could potentially buy four or $500 gift cards for the next four months, you buy all your groceries on Whole Foods gift cards, but you're able to front load $2,000 on your card now. Um, if you spend a lot of money on Amazon, you could do the same thing. So I would say one way to kind of front load your spending is to go prepay for things on gift cards that you know you're going to spend. Don't go buy a $1,000 Home Depot gift card if you don't have a $1,000 Home Depot purchase coming. Like, don't do that. Um, but that's an option. If I, I'm not ever a fan of paying fees, to put money, anything on your credit card, you know, like if you got to pay 3% fee to, you know, send your friend money on Venmo, I don't think it's ever worth getting those fees. But if you're towards the end of a welcome bonus, and you're not going to hit it, it probably is. So if you're like, in this case, it's like, if you spend 15,000, you get 60,000 points, and you're at 14,500. And there's nothing you need, like, maybe send your partner 500 bucks, pay the 3% fee, which is only going to be like $15, and make sure you get your 60,000 points. Absent, you're on the cusp of getting a bonus, not a fan of paying fees. So that's one. And then on the business card side, I think a lot of people think in order to get a business credit card, you need to be running a company with employees and all this stuff. And that's not true. You do need to have a business, but a business can also mean a sole proprietorship, which means you're not, you don't have a tax ID number for the business. It's not necessarily a legal entity. Uh, it could be I drive for Uber every now and then, or I sell stuff on Etsy, or I have a blog and I don't monetize it yet. But one day, you know, one day I want to monetize my blog or I want to monetize my social media account. Like anything that could be a business that you're starting to work on now uh, would qualify. If you tutor someone, if you consult on the side, if you do some freelance work. So a lot of times business cards have tremendously larger welcome bonuses and could help accelerate points earning very quickly. Uh, and you can sign up for them with your own social security number. You don't have to have a business tax ID. And so I would just say, look into that. If there's anything you have in your life that could potentially kind of fit the mold of business income uh, or future business income, because I'm looking, it's like Southwest card, the personal ones are all 50,000 points and the business ones go up to 120,000 points. Uh, there are a lot of chase cards that are 50,000 point for personal. And then you go to the business side and, you know, some of them are a hundred thousand point. So you can really, really accelerate points earning, uh, with, with welcome bonuses and you can also accelerate it with business cards. So I have a list of all the cards and all their bonuses right now at all the hacks.com slash cards. If people are interested, the links on there are links that uh, are partner links. So obviously you'll be supporting the show, but just know in advance. Uh, but there are a lot of cards there and, and you know, all the bonuses there as well. One other thing I love about the Southwest card is that it's with Chase. I have cards with Barclays, South, uh, American Express, Capital One. And for me personally, I like Chase the best. I just, it 
just my personal favorite. So I, I love that the Southwest cards through through them as well. Uh, Chris, I used to you... say that. I used to say that, and why then I got a, I got a Capital One card, hate it. and it's so good. You know why I, I hate it? Tell me, tell me why you love it, but I'll tell you why I hate it. So I can't. I have the. Ooh, go ahead. Have you tell me first. I was gonna say I can't pay ahead the balance. So if I if I charge fifty bucks on the credit card and I go to try to pay it on Capital, like it's pending as fifty bucks, I can't go to Capital One and pay fifty bucks. If I do that on Chase, I can pay anything that's pending because it recognizes that as a charge already, and that drives me nuts. With every the only place I've been able to do it is Chase, and that's why they're my favorite. Mm. So for me, I'm like, I don't want to pay the card off before the statements do because it's like a free a free 30 day loan. But the few things that Capital One started doing that are really impressive. And so I have a Venturex card. When I did my analysis of the two cards that for the average American spending pattern re- get you the highest return, it was the Amex Gold and the Venturex. Amex Gold's 4X dining and groceries and Venturex is 2X on everything. So it's simple. There's no like secret categories. Just everything is 2X. And I was playing around on the Venturex site. So one thing, they have a browser extension that anytime you're checking out, they will create a virtual card for you. And you could put that virtual card in and then set it to auto lock. So if you're buying something on some website that you're like, I don't really know about this website, you could buy it with a virtual card that's not your regular card number, set it to auto lock the next day and know that if someone ever were to get the credit card number that you paid for that transaction with, it would never work again. Or if you're signing up for like a seven day trial, you could put a virtual card in there, lock it the next day and know that if you forget to cancel that trial, they're not going to be able to charge your credit card. Uh, So that feature is so easy to use on Capital One. I know a couple other banks and issuers have it, but it's just, it's not as easy. The second one, my wife got this email and it was like, hey, we've noticed you got two charges for the same thing. Is this correct? She clicked a link in the email and within 30 seconds, they disputed and refunded the charge. Like it wasn't, it didn't require her to go look at her statement. They noticed it, reached out to her and fixed it all automatically, which was awesome to see. Um, So it's a handful of little things like that where I just feel like Southwest is ahead of the game. And I really, I don't know, or sorry, not Southwest. Cap, there's a handful of things like that where I feel like Capital One is just really pushing the envelope on what you can do with uh you know with software and technology when it comes to credit card and i just really love it i just hope everyone follows suit where i don't like southwest is that they only let all these budgeting tools like copilot and mint import 90 days of history so unlike chase unlike chase everyone will pull in a year of history if you're going to go try out copilot or mint or any of those apps you're going to get a full year of transactions that can really just make it easy to go back and see how you were spending and Southwest is only going to give you, or Capital One is only going to give you 90 days. So you can go into Capital One's website and export a year of history if you have a Capital One card, but you can only pull in automatically 90 days of history, which is frustrating. It's funny. We both have these small things that like, really, neither of them are big. Like my thing, being able to pay it right away is not really that big of a deal. I could just wait till the transaction posts. It's a couple of days and then I could pay it. Like it's not really a big deal. Your stuff's not really that big of a deal either, but we both have our, our preferences. That's kind of funny. Do you know on the Southwest cards, they have, if I remember correctly, three, I believe, Southwest personal cards. Do you know, can you only earn that intro bonus one time? So like, let's say, could you get all three cards and earn the bonuses three different times? Or can you only earn it one time? So I mean, you definitely can't usually open up a card if you already have the card. Um so well, they have three one. different ones. So like they have yeah, yeah, but a I'm, priority card, a premier, and a plus. Like if I already have priority, can I open the plus and still get the bonus? Yeah, you can definitely do that. So a lot of people's strategy is to open um, two cards and get South Companion Pass. I think you will find, I, I think it's, I, w- I would need to do some homework. I know you could definitely have multiple cards because that's what I did. But I don't know if you can do two personal. I know you can do a personal and business. You can even do it maybe on the same day. Um, I'm I've about done to the do personal a- and business, but that's why yeah. I'm curious. So I'm kind of like out. Now, so that's why I'm wondering if I could do a second business and a second personal or not. Yeah, I'm going to pause and you can delete this pause. And I know exactly the article that will tell me to answer this, but I just don't know. It better be on all the hacks.com. I don't have blog, so. You don't have a if blog I, at all? I mean, no, I don't write blog posts per se. Uh, I should. Okay. Okay, you could delete all that. And um, 
so sa I know that Chase's rule is that you can't be a current card member of the card or have gotten a bonus in the last two years. So business card excluded. So I think you can only get a personal card. You can, I think you can only get a bonus on a personal card uh, every two years. But do so, they count as different cards though? That's the thing. Like, yeah, yeah, no, no, no. I'm saying I think you can't be a Southwest Rapid Rewards card holder and haven't got a bonus in the last 24 months. So, it counts so you might have to, every two, every 24 months, you might have to close the card. So one thing when it comes to card closing, a lot of people think, oh, I've, I, I just, I, you listen to this episode, you're like, why am I using this stupid Bank of America credit card. Don't necessarily go close every card. Your credit score is really impactful for a multitude of things from getting good interest rates on loans in the future to getting approved for credit cards. And one of the factors is how long have you had most of your lines of credit? So if you have a card that you've had for 10 years and you realize it's not the best card, you might not want to get rid of it because it might be that anchor, you know, kind of bringing the average number of years you have on your credit report up. And so the thing that you'll want to do is you'll want to either, this is my sequence of events, is one, if there's no annual fee, just keep it open, right? You don't have to close it. You could just keep it open. And I try every year, my trigger is the holidays. Like if I'm going out on the holidays and I'm buying like a stocking stuff or a small gift, I just cycle through the old cards to make sure I put a transaction on that card every year. Um, and for some reason, the holidays is like my trigger. Oh, it's holidays. I gotta, I've got two or three cards that are old. I'm gonna go put a, put a couple bucks on these cards. Another option is put like a small recurring subscription on each one, like your Netflix bill or something. Um, and if if you if it's not if it does have an annual fee, you can one call up the card issuer and ask them, say, "Hey, I like this card. I'm not spending a lot of money on it. The annual fee is just a little too high for me right now." Some cards will say, "Oh, we'll waive the annual fee next year. Great, you can punt the the it down the line." Or, "Oh, if you could spend." three thousand dollars on the card in the next three months we'll give you fifty thousand points or so, some crazy retention offer so if you google around for card name retention offer you see a bunch of blog posts of people that are like oh here are the retention offers people have recently gotten for this card third option is you can downgrade the card so um you know a lot of cards have a free version or a free card in the family so the chase sapphire preferred you could downgrade to the chase freedom or the freedom flex or the freedom unlimited um, there are a lot that's true about United cards. There's a free version you could downgrade them. So if you're like, gosh, I have this card, it has an annual fee. They're not going to give me any bonus. Instead of canceling it, you could just downgrade it to a no annual fee card. You can call up or even use like the secure chat and just say, Hey, is there a card? Can, can I downgrade this card to a version with no annual fee? If none of that works and you had the card open for 12 months, you can cancel it. Um, and, and the only hacks there are one, I try to wait over 12 months because there's some language in a few of the card, uh, kind of terms of service that say, you know, they basically say effectively, like we're, we're, we could do things if it looks like you're the kind of person that opens up a card, gets a bonus and cancels it in the first 12 months. But most issuers have a rule that you can get the annual, this annual fee refunded if you cancel within 30 days of it hitting your account. So you can wait till the 13th month, even 366 days and cancel it. And then you will like never be on the list of person canceled within 12 months, um, which is a place to you don't want to be is like seen in the issuers as opens a card and cancels it right away after you get the bonus. That's they, they look down on that. Um, so those are a bunch of options there on Chase. If you ever cancel, if you do get to a point, you have to cancel a card and that card had a pretty high credit limit. You can actually move the credit between cards. So if you had a card with a $20,000 limit and you're going to cancel it and you have another card with a $10,000 limit, you could call Chase and say, hey, could you move $19,000 over to the other card, which will now have a $39,000 limit, and then cancel the card after you've reduced the limit to $1,000. So if, you, if, if that limit is important to you, you can move it around. When I was commuting into an office for work, I listened to a ton of podcasts. But with me working from home these days, I don't really listen to many podcasts. That said, yours is one I tune into when the guests or the episode topics are interesting to me. One of the Which is semi time, right? Yeah, everyone, every single one. No, I, I, I am very picky these days, like because I don't have a lot of time to listen. So, like, I really read. Like before, your show would be one I'd listen to every episode, just because I like the show. So I'd listen to every episode. There's very few podcasts that I do that to these days. So I just look at the title of the guest and see if it's something that's really relevant to me right now. And yours is frequent, but not always. And and one that was, it's kind of recent, kind of not. It's been a few months now, but it was with Bill Perkins. And it was the author of Die With Zero. 
And I want you to tell us a bit about his book and his philosophy. I think it's fascinating. And I think it's one that the audience will want to learn a lot more about. Yeah. So first off, thank you for listening. Second off, I've started doing something recently. I've, I've realized that some people just don't have time for every episode. And so I write a newsletter where I try to summarize some of the conversation in a newsletter. So if you're listening to this and you're like, gosh, I just can't do another podcast, but I could do another newsletter. I try to write like two, 3,000 word newsletters to hit on a lot of the main points. It's never going to be as comprehensive as the podcast. It's never going to be as timely as the podcast, but backup, backup alternative for, for someone who maybe has time for a newsletter and not another podcast. Um, but Bill Perkins was such an interesting conversation, probably changed my perspective on money more than any conversation I've had this since starting the podcast. And his philosophy is you shouldn't just aimlessly go, go down life trying to increase your net worth every month because you should really be trying to increase your net fulfillment in life. And there will be times where your life might be better used your time. I'm sorry, that makes no sense. You might be better off doing something now than saving money and trying to do it later. So if we, a lot of us, if we look at our parents, right, and we wonder, could my parents run a marathon? Definitely not. Uh, could my parents climb Machu Picchu right now? Definitely not. So there are things that when you're older, you just don't have the time, energy, health, you know, phys physique to do. And so if one of your goals is one of those things, you really should be prioritizing it earlier. And a lot of the data he shares is super fascinating about the fact that a lot of people have more money in retirement than they, they think, and they spend less than they thought. And so his case is make sure you're not waiting till you're old to spend money and then not able to use it the way you want. And when I left that conversation, I was talking to my wife and she was like, we have X, X dollars of net worth. And she's like, I think the goal for this year should be a little bit more. And I was like, I think the goal should not be a little bit more. I was like, what if our goal has nothing to do with increasing our net worth? What if our goal this year is to not increase our net worth? What if our goal this year is to not decrease it, but to spend the money that we otherwise could have saved and spend it on life, right? Like there's only so many years where our kids are gonna be young enough, they're not in school, we can take them places. Like maybe this is the time, maybe it's not, but let's not just default into the assumption that all we should do with our money is just save, 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 save. And right now, my wife and I are both working full time on all the hacks. We're never going to have as much flexibility with where we live and work as we probably will. Maybe we'll do this forever and we'll continue to have this. But if if this ever stops or if she ever decides she doesn't like working with me and wants to do something else, um, you know, she'll have to go to work. She'll have to go to an office. For right now, we have a lot of flexibility. So maybe we should use that flexibility. Go live abroad. Maybe we should do longer term travel. I don't know. But I don't want to assume that the best use of our savings is to just keep increasing our net worth. Now, I realize I say this from a place where I feel like we've saved enough to kind of cover our retirement. Obviously, that those priorities will be different for everyone. But I think a lot of people wait till they're 50, 60, 70 to start spending their savings. And then they leave a, you know, a bunch of money to their kids because they couldn't spend it all. And even if that's going to be you, Bill argued, give the money to your kids earlier. Like if you're going to leave money to your kids, give it to them earlier because you actually get to see the joy they get from it, right? If you want, like, it, it's just so interesting. You get no joy. If you want to donate your money to charity, great. Donate it to charity when you're younger so you can see the impact it has. It just totally changed my whole perspective on how I want to think about money and what I want its purpose to be. And I was just aimlessly going down the maximize my net worth path. And now I'm like, do I want to increase my net worth right now? Maybe I do. Maybe we decide we want more of a cushion because we don't have the stability of full-time kind of jobs with salaries. Maybe we do want to focus this year on building up more of a, you know, a buffer in our kind of checking account, if you will, or, or savings account because I don't, I want high interest. But uh, you know, maybe that's our goal. Any everyone's goal could be different, but reframing the conversation on how do I get the most out of my money, how do I maximize life is I think the thing we should all be trying to achieve. And so that was episode 91. You can go to allthehacks.com slash 91. You can find it in the show notes. But I think that episode, I think it's like number one episode I've done in terms of downloads. And I think anyone would go listen to that and have an amazing new perspective. You don't have to adhere to all of it, but I would be shocked if people didn't listen and say, I want to do something different than I thought I did.
I put the link in the show notes for everybody that's listening on our show currently. Just slide up in your podcast player or go to the investorspodcast.com and look at the show notes. The link to the episodes there. Like Chris said, I highly recommend you listen to it. It I haven't read the book yet. I really want to, but I think Chris's episode did such a good job covering it that I almost feel like I don't even need to read the book. I feel like I kind of got the gist of it, but I'll still read the book, but it, even just the episode itself has has really changed my philosophy a lot. And I love I love to combine this concept from Bill with another concept from Alex Ramosi where he talks about seasons. He says, okay, well, like if you have five different things you want to do, just do one for right now. You're in that season. And if you want to do a second thing, now you're in that season. And if you want to do something else, you're in another season. Like you don't have to say no to things. You can just do them in different seasons. So what Chris was saying is maybe right now this year is a season where you're spending money rather than saving. And and maybe next season is is all about saving. And so I think it's be really powerful for me at least to combine those two concepts and and it's really i've been it's made a big difference in in my personal life and how i've been spending money how i've been saving money and, and i've been trying to enjoy it a bit more recently than i had been i had been very i don't want to say i was quite a penny pincher but i was more on that side than i was in terms of like being spending a lot of money so it's recently i've been spending a bit more than i had been i definitely was good. in that side you were a penny pincher uh, yeah i mean i was just I was being irrational. So I had this conversation towards the end of the episode where I'm like, I want to take this trip and I just feel like there's not a good deal on the points right now. And he's like, what are you optimizing for? Are you optimizing for getting the best deal of your points? Or are you optimizing for taking the trip? Like, what is the thing you care about? If the thing you care about is taking the trip with your family, maybe there's not a good deal with points. So maybe you spend money on it. Maybe you just accept that you're not going to get the best value of your points, but you're going to go on the trip. And it was so funny because we were talking about what to do. It was the holidays. My wife had never been to London. She's from the mountains. And she she was like, we live in California. We're not going to experience something cold. And so even though London is not like the quintessential, like snowy winter destination, you know, it has a very holiday charm. And so we were like, you know what? Screw it. We ended up booking the flights. It turns out that we actually ended up also getting a good deal. But we committed to go before we knew whether there was a deal to be had. And that year, which is very rare for London, it snowed while we were there. It was like everything that we got that perfect experience that we were looking for. And had I had I my old version of me would have been like, well, if there's not a good deal, let's maybe we go next year. Like and it was just it's been the same thing happened. Not quite as great on the deal side. A couple weeks ago, my parents told us that in 2023, there is like one week where we were free and they were free to help watch our kids. And so if we were going to take a trip without our children, there was a week to do it. And we were like, great, what are we going to do? And we started looking and we couldn't find anything that was a great deal that week. And we just bit the bullet and we paid for a not great deal. Like we just paid the extra money, probably 50% more than we wanted to. And granted, it didn't put us into debt, but it was like, I was looking for the deal. I didn't find the deal. And I thought back to the episode, like literally this moment with Bill Perkins where he's like, what are you optimizing for? Are you optimizing for the deal or taking the trip? And I was like, we only have one week. If we don't go this week, you know, and if we don't do something awesome, we're going to look back and say, we wasted the one week where my parents offered to watch our children. Like, what are we doing? So we just took the trip and we paid the extra money and I have no regrets. Like it was amazing. And that's what I want to do more of. Uh, that's what I want to use my money. And maybe that means I'm going to spend less money on other things in the future, which is also okay. Like I can also just say, you know what? I'm going to like ratchet back somewhere else. And, you know, based on my co-pilot spending for this month, maybe I should do that uh, <laughs> over budget. So, uh, you know, maybe next month you'll notice us cutting back a little bit somewhere to kind of feel better about it. And I guarantee the satisfaction we got from that trip will be worth cutting back on going out to eat for a couple months. It's funny, July must be a spending month because I am way over budget this month as well. So uh, I had some home improvement stuff that I had to get done that I've been just kind of putting off that I finally got done. Had to fix my truck a little bit. So it's been uh, yeah, it's been a heavy, heavy expense month for me. But uh, Chris, we've we've had a great episode. I've really enjoyed it. We could keep going for hours and hours. We'll have to have you back again soon. Before we wrap up, tell everyone listening where they should go to find you, listen to your podcast, everything you got going on. Everything's all the hacks. So you can search that in the podcast player you're looking at listening to right now. You can go to allthehacks.com. You could go to Google. You could go to whatever your favorite search engine is. Uh, anywhere you look for all the hacks, I'd be surprised if I wasn't the first result. And we got a lot of great content. It's not just about points and miles. We spend a lot of time talking about money. We spend a lot of time talking about life. Everything from negotiating to 
family to, gosh, we did an episode on meditation. Uh, and then we do these cool travel guides. So about once every one to two months, we'll pick a destination and we'll go really deep on that destination and do a whole episode about it. So I, I don't want to make it just about one type of optimization because I think you can kind of go too deep. I love the 80-20 rule. So uh, I'm trying to break down that 80-20 stuff for you so that if you're thinking about insurance, we got an episode that'll give you everything you need to know about optimizing your insurance policy. Links to all of Chris's resources will be in the show notes. Like I said, throughout the episode, I'll split a link to some of my favorite stuff uh, as well below. So guys, if you're interested in checking it out, go there. Chris, thanks so much. I really appreciate it. Dude, thanks for having me. This is awesome. If you read a good book and you choose not to implement anything from it, then it was nothing more than a form of entertainment. I also think the books behind me represent all of the mentors that I've had conversations with in my own time. It won't be noticeable at first, but eventually you'll wake up in this different destination, health, wealth, happiness, and you'll be like, how in the world did I get here?